Welcome to module 52 of Point Set Topology course part 1. So, today we shall take up the study of normality again. Characterization of normality. Characterization in terms of continuous functions. In fact, we will have two different characterizations which are closely related to one another. One is due to horizon, and then using that, another one is due to TSA. The central idea is that the set of all continuous real valued functions on a space must be able to reveal some properties of the space itself. Often in algebraic geometry and sometimes in algebraic topology also, this is the central theme. Look at the set of real valued or complex valued functions or those which have some extra properties and so on declare them as what is known as coordinate space, coordinate ring. And then the ring will dictate all the geometry and topology. So this is the theme they follow. We don't go into that depth here, but the idea of why we need uh, such a thing like characterization only for that reason I am telling you so where it is much more important than to us so we can ask a vague question how large is the set of all continuous real valued functions on a given space x The study of this leads to a different kind of topological results altogether with applications to problems such as, I have just mentioned a few of them here, metrization problem, embedding problem, embedding problem it just means that take a space whether it can be embedded inside some Euclidean space of finite or infinite dimension and exploring the interrelationship between the the ring structure the algebraic structure of cxr with the topological properties of x so these are the few things for example when you go to function theory it is not all continuous functions they take they will take analytic functions okay so that is what is important for them in complex analysis for example if you go to algebraic geometry they will only take polynomial functions okay so it depends upon for us if you want to study the entire topology you must better take continuous functions okay in differential topology you will take differentiable functions smooth functions and so on So we shall not be able to discuss any of these topics, I mentioned three of them in this course, more than what I have mentioned. And I have mentioned it only because why the Uri Jones characterization or T's characterization is important. But some of these problems and applications will be taken up in part two of this course. Okay, so let us proceed with uh, these characterizations. How one might have uh, 
you know, come up with this kind of thing, I would like to tell. I, I cannot uh, read uh, Irizon's mind, uh, nor I can go back in history and so on. Okay, in being go back in time. So I'm guessing that this may be the one which led him to consider such a thing. So again, go back to metric spaces. Take any subset A, consider the distance function from A. So distance function is defined from X. Okay. D underscore A X is equal to D X A. You can write in two different notations, which is nothing but infimum of all the distance between D comma X comma A, where A reigns over A. X is fixed. So that is the distance from A, okay, the infimum of all these systems. For the point X, distance between X and A is defined like this, okay. It's easily checked that DA is continuous, okay, on the whole of X. And clearly, if A is inside A, then D of, you know, we can put uh, X equal to A, so that will be zero. So infimum will be zero. So it will vanish, right? But it will vanish on A bar also. In fact, A bar is precisely the set wherein this function will be identically zero. Yeah. Okay. So that is easy to check. Huh? Now let B be another set. Consider the function g from x to r defined by gx equal to dxa minus dxb. See for a, a and b, we have defined dxa and dxb. Take the difference. I have no speciality here. First I took a, and then I am taking b. That is why I am rightly right. Otherwise, I could have taken dxb minus dxa also, as good as this one. This function is again continuous because it is sum of two continuous functions, difference of two continuous functions. And it is non-positive on the closure of A because the first term will be zero. And on the closure of B, it is non-negative because the second term will be zero. Okay. Now, you take a special case when A and B are disjoint closed sets. When A and B are disjoint closed sets, at least one of them must be non-zero for all the points because A and B are disjoint. So if dx A and dx B are both zero, x will be inside A intersection B. So there is no intersection, right? That's it. Therefore, the sum function will never vanish. dxa plus dxb. What does that mean? I can divide by that function. Okay. Sum and difference are both continuous. Sum is never zero. Therefore, this quotient function is also continuous. I am calling it as f. Okay. So, fx is the difference function divided by the sum function. Why one you think of this one is, is itself a mood question. But I think I have thought about this one. So Eurizons must have thought about this one. How I thought about it also this mystery. I, I could come up to this one after long thinking. Oh, this must be the reason. Then f from minus x, x to minus 1 plus 1 because the numerator, modulus of the numerator is never bigger than the modulus of the denominator. Okay. Denominator is already non-negative, actually positive. So, this is always the, the value will be between minus 1 plus 1. Okay. Moreover, A and B are closed subsets. We know that f of A, f of a, x belong to A, this is 0, this is 0, so it's minus of D divided by plus D, which is minus 1. 
similarly f of b equal to plus 1 so you see what we have produced is a continuous function from the whole of x which vanishes exactly sorry which which is exactly minus 1 on a and plus 1 on b okay now you can take just a little a small neighborhood of minus 1 and a small neighborhood of plus 1 i have taken last sufficiently large namely minus 1 to 0 and here 0 to 1 only thing is i have been careful that they are disjoint open subsets in minus 1 to plus 1 take the inverse image call them as u and v they will be disjoint open subsets okay clearly they contain a and b respectively okay so suddenly what we have proved is that disjoint closed subsets of metric space can be separated by open subsets actually they can be separated by continuous functions so in particular every metric space x is normal indeed since every metric space is normal a subspace of metric space is also metric space it follows that every metric space is completely normal okay it's completely normal also we have we have seen that singleton sets are closed in a metric space that means they are fresh spaces. Therefore, complete normality implies regularity as well as Hausdorffness also. Okay. Once they are fresh, regular implies Hausdorff. Complete norma normality implies regularity. Complete normality implies normality. Okay. Anyway, so all these things are true for a metric space. So why I'm guessing is that perhaps this function f was the motivating example for the celebrated result known as Eurizon's lemma. Of course, it is due to Eurizon. There is no mistake in that. So this is the lemma. A topological space X is normal if and only if it satisfies the following Eurizone's condition. Yeah. You see. So again and again, I will be requiring this condition. So I have named it as U C Eurizone's condition. What is this? For every pair of non-empty disjoint closed sets A, B, and X, there exists a continuous function f from x to 0 1 such that f a is 0 and f b is 1. See if f a is singleton 0 just means that a has to be non-empty. Similarly b has to be non-empty. For that reason we have to assume that they are non-empty disjoint closed sets. Okay. Otherwise in the statement of Eurizone's you know definition of Eurizone's uh, uh, normality, you know, if you take whatever uh, definition you take, three of them, even if A or B is empty, it's okay. It's not so, it doesn't cause any problem there. But if you want to have function theoretic uh, uh, characterization here, then you have to take A and B are non -empty and they are non-empty. Then only you can write f is 0 and f is 1. You can also do minus 1 to plus 1 here by changing the, the, inter, uh, the interval, the co-domain interval by homeomorphism. Okay. So that is not so crucial. Getting a closed interval as a co-domain okay, and getting a function f from this one wherein the the two sets 
are going to two distinct points. That is the Kruskal matter. It could be F A equal to some A, F B equal to some B, where A and B are distinct points of this. Okay, so that's the crucial matter here. All right. Okay, so one way is obvious, which we have seen already in some sense. Assume that you see it satisfied by X. Take A and B, any two non-empty disjoint closed sets. Okay, and take a function f from X to zero one. Continuous function, so say f is zero and f b is one. Then take zero to half, half open, and half to one, again half open. Take the inverse image, call them as u and v. They will contain a and b respectively. So that is the condition for Urizon's uh, the uh, normality. If one of them is empty, you can always take, uh, suppose A is empty, then you can take U empty and B equal to all of X. So that is obviously satisfied. There is no need to worry about that. So normality is satisfied if U C is satisfied. The converse is where we have to work hard out. Well, hard work is done by Urizon. We are doing hard work in a different sense. We have to learn them properly, right? Okay. Now let X be normal and A and B be non-empty disjoint subsets. The second condition, the definition, the set definition tells you if you take A and B complement, A is contained in the B complement, A is closed, B is open. There will be a open subset G such that A is contained inside G contained inside G bar contained inside B complement. So I'm using the second condition in the definition of normality. So we have started a process here that is going to be a iteration of this. So I am denoting the first iteration by this g by g half okay the this notation will be clear in a moment so you have to wait right now it will be better if you write it as g1 okay so but now what i want to do that is what i have to tell you apply the normality to both the situations so this is almost like you know this is one point and there is another point and I have chosen the half of the middle of them. If you have chosen middle from the first point to middle and the middle point to the second point, again you can choose middle of them. So that is the kind of thing that is going on here. But middle doesn't make sense. Something in between with the relation, uh, with the relation of what inclusion maps of sets. So that is what is being done. So what I want to do is now between A and G half and G bar half and B complement. Okay, I introduce two more open subsets which we shall denote by G one fourth and G three fourth respectively such that from A to G half, G half is open, A is closed, G, G one fourth will sit there contained inside G one board closure. Similarly, G half to, okay, G, G, we have come up to G half, right? G half is contained in the G half bar. That's already there. We, we, we are using that one now. It's G bar, is G half bar. G half bar to B complement, why it's again open. We'll have one more open subset here, G three four contained inside G three four bar. See what I have done from 1 by 2, 1 by 2, half of that is 1 by 4. Between 1 by 2 and 1, I have 3 fourth. So keep on cutting down by half. What are those numbers? Next time you'll get 1 by 8, 
डिनोमिनेटर इज ऑलवेज अ पॉवर ऑफ टू बट आई वॉन्ट ओनली ऑल ऑफ दम बिटवीन जीरो एंड वन आई एम इंक्लूडिंग जीरो एंड वन जीरो इज टेकिंग द प्लेस ऑफ ए okay and one is taken the uh, the b complement is taken in the place of one there i don't need to write uh, any symbols for them so in the between i am going to put all these open sets the set they are contained inside the their own closure and then the closure is contained inside the next one and so on so that is what i am going to do next step will be an open subset between a and g have in g14 and one on this side also in everywhere in between you know g4 is g4 is closed and bc is open so between them i can put one more one more open set and so on so go on squeezing open subsets in between okay so let d denote the set of all dyadic rationals in the interval 0 1 namely integer divided to power n m and n are positive integers okay m less than 2 power n you can take m to be only odd numbers if you like if there is some uh, power you can cancel out but i want m to be less than 2 power n only okay carrying on with this process we obtain to each number here an open subset gt okay so all these new open subsets of x are indexed by this set so what is the property all of them are neighborhoods of a a is contained inside gt gt is contained inside gt bar gt bar is always contained inside b complement so this much is obvious but more than that between t and gt and gs what is the relation as soon as t is smaller than s okay gt bar will be contained inside gs so this is the property okay for example it is does not depend upon whether i have chosen them first or second or third and so on it depends upon whether the corresponding indices are bigger or smaller for example the first one that i have chosen is g half in the second stage i chose g 3/4 so g half bar is contained in the g 3/4 okay so next i will be choosing uh, you know 5/8 or 7 by 8 and so on so you have to compare the numbers first that can be compared the corresponding sets also must be compared in a stronger way namely the closure of the smaller indexed one must be contained inside the the other open set so gt bar is contained in such yes okay all that we have done is repetition of the normality condition inductively okay now we have produce a continuous function out of nowhere the crux of the matter is the dyadic rationals are dense inside r okay so once you have some 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 way of nominating these indices one can cook up functions out of that that is the whole idea so define fx equal to 1 okay if all the x uh, x is all in in gt complement for all t it does not belong to any of gts okay see all gt gts are inside inside what in gt bar itself inside Inside B, okay. So B complement. 
So if if they are not in this itself, x is in the G D complement, then I am defining it as one. Okay. Otherwise, I will define it as infimum of all t such that x is inside G T. See, at least this set is non-empty. Therefore, infimum makes sense. Okay. Anyway, this set once it is infimum, once it is non-empty, it is bounded below. All these numbers are bigger than or equal to one. Be actually bigger than one zero. So it is bounded below by zero. So infimum is a finite number. If it is empty, then you would have a problem. So whenever it is empty, you just define it as one. That is all right. <clears throat> Take the infimum. Of all x set, all all t set x is inside G T. Okay. <clears throat> Since all the G T, all t's are between zero and one, infimum whatever this set is, it has to be between zero and one. And this part is one, so zero is less than or equal to less than or equal to one. This is obvious from this definition. Now the first one says what? All the GTs contain a closures are contained inside B complement. So from this it follows that f of a will be zero. The infimum of all the dyadics inside zero one is zero, and f of b is one because it is x is not in any of them. Then only it is one. So, if it's in B, it cannot be in any of G T. So, it's in the complement of G T for all of them. So, the security property is already done very easily. The missing point, the important point, is that F is continuous. Okay, producing continuous functions. You know, very few such results are. Are there? Even proving uh, after proving something, we have to prove homeomorphism. So they are easier. Here, producing continuous function itself. So this is something fantastic that you have done. So first, we observe that the collection of all intervals of the form zero comma a and B open one for zero less than a, b less than one forms a subbase for the usual topology on the closed interval zero one. The usual topology, and then I am taking restriction. So I am I have to restrict the subbase also. So I don't want to take anything other than intervals which are subintervals of zero one. You have to take open there, but this is closed interval. So zero closed a open. This will be also an open subset. That is the difference. Similarly, b open and one closed. These are also open subsets of the closed interval zero one. If you take b plus c, suppose you take minus epsilon to a and intersect it with zero one, what do you get? You will get zero to a only, right? So this is what it is. Hence, once this is a base, sub base, it is enough to prove that to continuity of, you know, I am I want to prove continuity of this. F inverse of zero a is open. Similarly, F inverse of b one is also open, where a and b are arbitrary points of zero and one open. For that, I am explicitly proving that. F inverse of zero is union of all the GTs such that t is less than a. Okay, each GT remember is an open subset, so union is also open for all zero less than a less than one. I am going to prove this. Similarly, F inverse of b one, I am going to prove its union of all GT bar complement. You see, bar is closed. The complement is open. Again, this is an open subset. But now, this time, 
T is strictly bigger than B. Okay. So, 3 and 4, if I prove, the theorem will be complete. All right. Let us prove 3. Take a point X inside X such that it is on the left hand side. What is the meaning of that? F of that X is strictly less than A. Of course, it is always bigger than or equal to 0. Okay. This implies, remember what is the what is the definition of fx? Infimum of all t such that x is inside gt, this is this is fx, it's less than a. Okay. What is the meaning of infimum is less than some number? There must be something here which is less than that. So there exists a gt such that x is in gt and this t is less than a because infimum is taken over all such t. So, I have not done anything other than just definition of infimum. Okay, not very serious also. Infimum is also there. So, LHS of 3 is contained inside RHS. For each point x, I have found a gt here. All right. The other way inclusion is obvious. As soon as x belongs to gt, infimum will be smaller than that. Okay, and t is less than a, so it will be here. f of fx will be less than a. Right? Even if one x, even if one t is such that x is in gt and that t is less than a, it will be, infimum will be smaller than a. So it is f of f of x will be less than, less than a, so it is here. So, this way containment is obvious. Alright? So, fourth one. To prove 4, so let us take x, which is that b is less than fx less than 1, less than or equal to 1. If fx is 1, then remember when it is 1, it is inside gt complement for all t contained in, you know, belong to d. No, no gt will contain it, it is in the gt complement. So, fix some s belonging to g, s belong to d such that s is bigger than p. Take some s inside D because B is less than 1. Between B and 1, there must be some s. What is s? S is an element of D. So, this is where I am using the, the fact that the dyadic rationals are dense. So, we can find a T belonging to D such that this s is less than T. See, I have chosen B less than S less than 1. So, between S and T, I can choose S and 1, I can choose another T. So, that is also again density of this result. So, I can choose actually B less than S less than T and T less than equal to 1. It follows that G S bar is contained inside G T. This was the choice pro uh, property 2, right? And hence, X is inside G S bar complement. Okay, X is in G T complement. Okay, its G T complement will be contained inside G S bar complement. Now consider the case. One case is over. Namely, if F X is one, X belongs to one of them. Remember what I have to show. I have to show that the point in the left hand side, namely point which looks like this one b less than fx less than equal to 1 is in the union of all gt bar and so on. I have found one such so gs bar complement. Now it may happen that b is less than fx and fx is strictly less than 1. When fx is strictly less than 1, it is a second condition, namely fx is infimum of 
all t such that x is inside gt this means that there is a t such that okay x is inside gt first of all right and then you have to take that fx that fx is bigger than b but less than 1 is what i have done also it follows that x is not in gs for any b less than s less than fx if there is a case then fx would be infimum it will be smaller than that one so if s is smaller than fx x cannot be in gs because fx is the infimum okay so now you take b less than r less than s less than fx again i am using <coughs> density of d here <coughs> okay then x cannot be in gs implies that x cannot be in gr closure because all the closure of corresponding things are contained in gs okay which is same thing as saying that x is in gr bar complement so we have found out another element which contains on the left hence lh is contained in that rh so you see the proof of four required us to use the the density of d at least three times here huh? so proof of 3 was easier the proof of 4 took some time right we have not yet completed the proof what we have to do rhs is contained inside lhs right even that is also not in the, the third case it was very easy in this part little more you have to say <clears throat> suppose f x belongs to rhs rhs is what union of all g bar s c namely g bar complements so x is in one of them for some s which is bigger than b that is the definition of the right hand side this implies that x cannot be in gt for all s bigger than t that is bigger than b so between you know s between s and b if you take another t here x will not be inside gt because x is not in in gs bar itself gs x is inside gs bar complement okay on the other hand suppose x is not in the lhs of 4 okay i took it is in rhs i want to show that it is in the lhs lhs means what b is bigger than fx fx is of course bigger than about 1 so that is the meaning of x right so if that is not the case that's what i am telling you hence so suppose on the other hand x is not in lhs then fx must be less than or equal to b fx is less than or equal to b means what infimum is less than or equal to b okay then x must be in gt for some uh for all for all t bigger than b because the infimum is less than or equal to b right if something is bigger than b x must be x x is already inside some gt bigger than that one it will be definitely inside that because gt is contained inside gs for all t less than s so but that is absurd because we have just shown here that you know just here we have shown that x is not in gt as soon as s c is t is bigger between s and b but here it says that for all t bigger than that it should happen so that is absurd so lhs will be uh, rhs will be contained inside lhs you start with a point in rhs it contains a lhs this is what so this proves for and hence continuity of f is established therefore the completion of the proof is done okay so i made some remarks here in uc i have already done this one i will repeat it 
you can freely use any closed interval a b a less than b in place of 0 1 by merely composing with the linear homeomorphism t going to b minus a times t plus a of one it is convenient to use the interval minus one plus one instead of zero one like the the metric that we uh, considered you know d of x a minus d of x b divided by d of x a plus d of x b it was between minus one plus one so that is what we are going to do next time but sometimes you may have to choose some other numbers also so any closed interval you can take no problem okay that is the comment here there is no assertion about the uniqueness of the continuous maps in the uc there exists some function continuous function there may be plenty of them in that there are lots and lots of functions. The difficulty was showing that there exists one. After that, you can cook up many, many of them. Okay. So, one of the special uh, function, uh, you know, very specific one I want to have, and I want to go to, I am going to use that. So, I am going to introduce a notation here. Okay. Uh, temporary notation, like in Mather theory, you have this, the characteristic function. Let us introduce a temporary notation which we will use in the proof of the next theorem that we are coming. Given any two disjoint closed subset A and B of X, let us denote chi of AB. So it depends upon both A and B. A function, a continuous function from X to minus 1 plus 1 such that on A it is minus 1 and on B it is plus 1. There are many of them, okay. Any of them I will just call it as chi of AB. Depends upon the context. All that I need is it has this property and it's defined on the whole of X and it's continuous. That is why I am just writing this chi of AB. The only thing that we need here is that if X is normal, then such functions exist, such continuous functions exist. Okay, so choose any one of them and, and temporarily write it as chi of a b. So this is what I am going to do next time. I am going to use it next time. So this uh, comment also I have made, but I will repeat it. We have mentioned that normality is not hereditary. We have not proved it. Huh? However, it is weakly hereditary, namely every Closed subspace of a normal space is normal. That is very easy to find out, easy to prove because closed subspace of a closed subspace is closed. So start with a start with y as a closed subspace of x. If a and b are closed subspace of y, then they will be closed in x itself. Therefore, normality of x will will produce open subsets in X which contain A and B and disjoint. Now you intersect it with Y. Okay, so Y will be normal. So close the subspace of a normal space is normal. Okay, and that information is important and we are going to use that also in the next theorem. Okay. So let's stop here for the next theorem tomorrow. Thank you.